Thessalonians, from First Thessalonians 5, which we uh, read for the, the first reading. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This was a special week because we had a wedding this week. If you hadn't heard, uh, Peter's son and son Jeremiah and uh, Gloria Vandermaiden were married here on Thursday in a kind of a semi-private ceremony. There were only like about 12 of us here. And uh, Peter asked me about, I think sometime about Wednesday or so, um, said we still needed a preacher for Sunday. Would I do that? Even though I was, you know, preaching coming up on Thursday. And I, oh man, that's that's a lot. And he said, well, just use the same sermon. Kind of joking. And I said, ah. And, and yet, as I started looking at the Thessalonians passage and the way it ends up and what I've chosen for a sermon title today, whether awake or, or asleep, we might be with the Lord. And that really is, it was very similar to the wedding sermon. The wedding sermon was about growing together and, and living together and getting to know each other. And that one ship that we have and the, the relationship between a bride and a groom mirrors the relationship between Jesus and his bride, the church. And so really, a wedding, a marriage that works out like God wants it to and is, is holy like God has it to be is worship of him who gave his life for us. And we talked about the, um, the whole idea of the husband being willing to give up his life for his wife, how Jesus gave his life for the church. So it is an act of worship almost when a couple marries and continues in that. I gave them some advice for the wedding. I told them about uh, kind of how things rise like a staircase as you as you go on in your in your marriage. You start out with acquaintance. You start out with with. Uh, Friendship, and then that goes to to uh, romance and love and commitment, and sometimes those things are kind of garbled in first as as people are getting to know each other, and and uh, but then as love happens, then you make more of a commitment to each other, and you finally end up in this kind of one ship where you are two together as God planned, and you are worshiping together, and you're committed to each other. And my charge to them was you will continue to grow closer. You'll continue to get stronger in these areas, but especially important is that love and commitment. And that's really the theme of our text, isn't it? That as we look at when God is coming and what is happening and what we will need to be or will be because he is coming, we will actually get into one ship. So we can actually say that we are so one with God that whether we're awake when he comes, whether we're still alive and the Lord, it says, shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the trumpet of the archangel and we who are alive will be caught up to meet him in the air. Or whether we're asleep in Jesus, we're still going to be with the Lord. And if we're awake when he comes, if we're awake right now, we have a job to do. We are with the Lord. He doesn't just say, okay, uh, you'll get me later. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll come get you, and, and now we'll be together. He says, no, we're together now. We're together because my son took care of that. He washed your sins. And, and so it's hope for sure, but it's not, as we like to say, it's not... Uh, Pie and pie, how's it go? Pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. That's not all it is. It's for right now. And that's the joy that we have as Christians is that we know Jesus is drawing closer and we draw closer to him. So drawing closer, what does it mean? Well, first of all, it means to get to know him in all things and to love him, knowing his will for you personally. 
and knowing what's going to happen. He's going to come for you. So let's look at this passage and, and kind of look at this whole point of growing together, getting closer and closer and closer. Starting out in verse 1, he says, Concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Woo. <coughs> I had a re we had a record breaking week of warm weather, and uh, and yet we were in the middle of that week, and it was great because I could get a lot of things done at home, which I needed to do. And in the middle of this record breaking week, we also knew that there were the season was different than the record breaking week seemed to indicate. The season is November. The season is late fall coming on to winter. Winter starts December 21st, but winter actually starts meteorologically, that's a hard word to say, uh, on December the 1st. That's usually when the snows hit, usually when things go. We have snow on Thanksgiving. We have snow earlier than Thanksgiving. Last year we had, what, two or three inches on Halloween on the end of October. So we're always, at this time of year, looking for seasons. And when we get something like we had this week where the season was warm extra early, that's what they would say in Louisiana as lanyard, which means a little something extra that you're not expecting that you get. Like if the if the baker throws in an extra donut or, or something like that, that's lanyard. A little something you didn't expect. And we had some lanyard with the weather this year, and it was really great. And uh if you're interested, it's spelled L-A-N-G-I-A-P-P-E. Right Just like it sounds. And, um, <laughs> and it's great. So, so I was working this week, and I got the trees pruned, and the leaves raked, and compost piles all set up and ready to go. The garage got painted another side of it, a lot of sanding. We, um, I was talking to Bill this morning, and, and I mentioned that uh, I've lived in that house 25 years and never painted the garage, and he was a little shocked at that. And yeah, thinking about it, probably should have done that maybe 15, 20 years ago, but we didn't. And, and it, was, uh, it needed a lot of sanding and a lot of scraping and all the things that goes on, but the weather was there. But still, with the chance to do all this stuff, I know that the seasons are changing. And I know this might have been the only good week that I had to do all this stuff. So I worked while it was warm because the cold is coming. Seasons will change. Cold, November, winter, December to March. No one had to tell me because I saw the seasons coming. I knew it was going to happen and I knew it is happening. So I got ready when I could. But with God's return, Paul says that you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. You might know the seasons. You don't need to have anything written to you because you kind of see what's happening. And yet you don't know when it's actually going to occur. Jesus said this in Acts 1 7. He says, It's not for you to know the times and the seasons. He says this, Acts 1 7, before he ascended to heaven. He said, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's not your job to know when he's coming. But I always have to look at the bus to see where he's going with this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come, has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You don't know when I'm coming again. That I don't even know. He said later in, in Matthew, earlier in Matthew, he said, uh, you know, only the Father knows, not even the Son knows. And he was speaking as the Son of God on earth. And I think now that, obviously, now that he is in heaven enthroned, he knows when he's going to come back. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, but God deals with that. But the point of, of all of that is that 
we need to be ready in season and out of season for his coming. And we can kind of look ahead and say, okay, we are closer to the end now than we ever were before. So we have work to do. The Holy Spirit was given to us in our hearts, in the word of God, to work together so we can go out and we can share the good news with people and let them know that Jesus is coming again. We are not in darkness, he says. He says um, that we know God. We've been redeemed by Jesus. We have his righteousness. It, it's yours. Your sin was paid for by him. One part of his bride, the church, as part of his bride, the church, Lord, I want to be in that number. You are in that number as Christ's church. So we wait. We wait ready. We wait awake and sober. Verse 4. You are not in darkness, brothers, for the day is for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. <clears throat> we are not of the night or of the darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Jesus gives us light to do the work of God. And we, we ask, okay, if, if I'm awake and I'm supposed to be sober and I'm supposed to be diligent and I have work to do, what is that work? And as we look at the next few verses, we see the work of God and then the tools that he gives us to do that work. Well, what is the work of God? One of my favorite uh, passages, kind of pairing of passages, is in... Uh, John chapter 9, Jesus points out the blind man to his uh, disciples. And they said, uh, okay, why was that man born blind? Did he, did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus said, uh, you got it all wrong, fellas. He was born blind so that the work of God could be manifested in him. And the disciples were probably trying to think, well, okay, that's great. What is this work of God that you're talking about? If we know about it, we can do it and then we're fine. Well, uh, a few chapters earlier, in chapter 6, the Pharisees asked the same question. Jesus said, you know, I, you work for, he said, you work for food, but I'm the bread of life. I give you food that you don't have to work for. And, and so the Pharisees, instead of trying to figure out what this great food was that God was going to give them, what did they look at? The work. Oh, tell us the work that you want us to do, and we'll do it, and then we'll be good. They, they totally missed the point. It wasn't that you work for this. It's that this is what I give you, the bread of life. And so Jesus said, okay, the work. Okay, he says, okay, guys, get this. It's not hard. The work of God is this, to believe in God and believe in him who God has sent. The real work that God wants from us is faith. And the work that we have that we can share with others is faith through evangelization, through Bible study, through all the things that we do as a church, through our, our witness, with the, the activities we do, the things that we give, all of that shows that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the one who redeemed us, the one who's coming, the one who gives everything to us. And so he says, do the work while it is day, because night comes when no one can work. So he says, uh, he says, you're not children of darkness. You are not of the night or of darkness, verse 5. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. So he says, let's be awake, let's be sober. And then he starts talking about the tools he gives us to do his work. We are light in the here and now. And I want to just kind of go back a little bit last Sunday. Uh, this is 
right now, we, this is the second to the last Sunday in the church year. Uh, next week, November 22nd, will be the last Sunday in the church year. And then November 29th starts Advent again. And as Becky's word said, we prepare ourselves for Advent. We prepare ourselves to again receive the word about the coming of the Lord. And I think that uh, whoever set up the system of going through the word every year was wise. It's kind of a neat thing to, again, revisit the whole life of Christ. Of course, I think as a pastor, as a preacher, you go and you look at the word and you say, okay, what is it you want me to share with this group this week, Lord? And sometimes it's not in that system, and yet it's in God's word, and he tells us to do it, we do it. But I think the system is really good because now we're going to be looking very soon at the tremendous thing, the tremendous work that God did through his messenger angels and through his prophets in the Old Testament and through John the Baptist to bring forth the, the Christ and to consecrate him, dedicate him, and put him in his ministry, all of that in the next few months. And it's it's amazing thing that God did. And so our job is to tell people about that story so that the Holy Spirit can work faith in their hearts. And when the Holy Spirit does the work in the heart of the believer through the preaching of the word of God, believers come. Come closer to him if you are a believer. Come to faith maybe for the first time. And when there is the turmoil that we see in the world, when there's the darkness that we see in the world, we know that God's light can take care of that. So in, in these trying times that we're in right now, we have the means, the tools to share God's love with the world. And he mentions some of them. Now, we know that in Ephesians, he gives us six different things, you know, the breastplate of righteousness and this and that and all these tools. Here he just mentions two of them, but they're they're very similar. Now, the breastplate in Ephesians is righteousness, the goodness of God, and, and here it's faith and love. Well, that's what righteousness is. It's God's love and our faith that receives it and makes us, God makes us righteous, and we accept it, receive it, believe it, know it. We have it. It's a total gift from God. It's worked in our heart through the Holy Spirit as we have heard the word of God. And that righteousness, that breastplate is hope and love. The hope of what God has done and the love that he did with it and, and what we have in him. That's the breastplate. That's our protection. That's what we are all about as we go into battle. And then another protective thing is the helmet. Which is, the, which is the hope of salvation. We know that Jesus is coming again. And then in verse 9, he says, God has not destined us for wrath, for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are of good courage, Paul says, because we would rather be away from the body and home with the Lord. And then another place Paul says, for me to live is Christ. To die is gain. It's even better. Because we'll be with him closer and more vividly and, and everything. God hasn't destined us for wrath. He's destined us to know him, to be his children, to have salvation and have it in our heart right now. To live is Christ, but to die is gain, even though, you know, that's, that's a fear we all have. How is it going to be? My wife was telling me about uh, a lady that, that uh, oh, I can't remember the story. I've had several stories like this. I'll tell the one I know better. <laughs> My friend, a pastor down in, in Louisiana was saying about the guy who, who came and, and did our water system at church. And after I left that church and moved, he, 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 we were talking on the phone one day and he said, uh, 
So I remember the man's name, but he was he was a Baptist gentleman. He was in his his church worshiping God, and he said to his wife, he said, "Boy, I'm just I'm just as happy as I can be. If the Lord would take me now, it would be a real blessing." And he sat down in his pew and he fell over and died. <laughs> you know, and we think, wow, what a way to go. No pain and everything. And, and the height of, I mean, his wife was crushed, I'm sure, and took her a while to get over that. But God, whether we're alive, worshiping, praising, to live is Christ. But to die is gain. This man is in heaven, worshiping around the throne. What a blessing that he is under. So finally, verse 10 comes up, and this is where I I kind of then thought about the young people, Jeremiah and Gloria, that they are now one flesh, that God wants them to be one together and grow together and be in that kind of one shift that they know each other very well and, and that they are as faithful to each other as Christ is faithful to us and we are faithful to him. And whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, we're with the Lord. And that's the whole point of Christ coming again that we have the hope that keeps us going in this life and then the joy that we will receive afterward also. What a blessing that is. And so he says, therefore, encourage one another. Build one another up. And just as you are doing. And that one got me because we don't always do that, do we? It's easier sometimes, instead of building one another up, to put a little barb in here or a little stumbling block in here or or just something because and maybe that makes us feel a little better. You know, I got to talk to a certain way, so I'm going to talk back. And, and we all do it. And God says, no, we need to be the people that I call you to be and build one another up in Christ and build the world up in Christ and build people up together. And just as you are doing, sometimes, sometimes the words of encouragement prick us to the heart. Because uh, while this is an encouragement for people to say, yeah, do this just as you're doing, if we're not, it gets us. And then we come on a Sunday morning. We come in our private devotions. We come with our spouses, we come with friends and say, I'm not doing everything I should do. And then, as Christians, we can encourage each other, like Paul does right here. Therefore, encourage one another. Build one another up, just as you are doing. If you're not doing it, think about that. If someone comes to you and confesses to you something that, oh, I'm just not, I'm not doing what I should do. Well, build them up, encourage them. You can do it. You can do it. There's the Lord Jesus who saved you from your sins. You've got everything that he is in you. That's what he did it for. So encourage one another. Build one another up in your most holy faith, it says, and that's what God wants. Lord Jesus, we pray. We ask that as we come before you on these final Sundays of the church year, as we look at what you did for us and what you will continue to do for us eternally, the joy that is ours now and the work that we have to do as we draw closer to you, and then the joy and the beauty of eternity as we are close to you, it's inexpressible. And even though we don't always do it, you forgive us, and we can encourage each other, we can build each other up, and we want to. So, Lord, we thank you. We ask your blessing upon everyone here and everyone on the Zoom. We ask your blessing upon our newlyweds, Jeremiah and Gloria. 
and ask you to come to touch them, to touch everyone here, to touch all of us, that you would have a people that are waiting for you, working as they wait, loving you, and in joy will receive you eternally. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may that peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in our Savior, Christ Jesus. Amen.